This is the Palin Update on Saranet Radio. I'm Kevin Shola. Nowhere else but America do we have such a privilege, such a blessing to be able to live as we do. As we mourn the victims of the mass shooting in Connecticut that killed 26 people, 20 of them children, we also try to move forward. Today, we talk to Dr. Karen Ruskin about how to talk to kids before they head back to school again after the new year and how parents can handle things. Governor Palin speaks out on the Connecticut massacre. We'll look back at her poignant comments, and she highlights a powerful video from CeeLo Green. Jim DeMint's replacement is named, and Governor Palin is happy about it. We'll tell you who will be the next U.S. Senator from South Carolina. Plus, the governor highlights a daily caller piece that unfairly attacks Fox News, and she calls on the president to help free a jailed pastor. Plus, our latest edition of Steel Resolve just ahead. Now we welcome in Dr. Karen Ruskin, a psychotherapist based in New England, to discuss how to move forward on the heels of the Connecticut tragedy. Really fortunate to have her expertise at our disposal today on the Palin Update on Saranet Radio. Dr. Karen Ruskin, so glad you could join us today. My pleasure. I wish it were, of course, uh, for a happier topic. Well, absolutely, and people are still just reeling over the unspeakable tragedy in Newtown. Just... An awful feeling in the pit of our stomachs across this nation. Little children during Christmas time, just as bad as anyone could imagine. And while we lost so many on that day, well, the reality is there are kids of all ages all across this country who are alive and are in school or will be heading back there at least after Christmas break. And I want to talk about how to deal with them, what what to say to them. And I guess it all depends on the child's age to start, right? Different approaches for, say, a six- or seven-year-old as opposed to a 14-year-old? Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head, Kevin. It's really important to be mindful of your child, not just age-appropriate, but their own personality-appropriate, their own behavior-appropriate. Some kids experience more of an anxiety reaction, where some children are more interested in learning details and it helps them feel calmer when they know more information. So you must pace what you're saying based on knowing your child. What do you tell a kid who flat out says, hey, mom or dad, I'm scared to go to school. Someone may come in and kill me. How, how do you address that if it, if it gets to that point? It's really important to reassure your child the low likelihood of this type of tragedy happening while balancing the validation of the reality. Because if you just ignore what they said and you say, oh, no, that'll never happen, then they don't feel heard. They feel misunderstood and de-understood, de-understood. It's, it's quite the word, de-understood. It's so important for a child to feel like their voice is being heard. So balance their worry with reassurance that there is a low likelihood, and also talk with them about the safety precautions that their particular school has, because by putting that into reality for them, they start to think about it and say, oh, yeah, that's right. My school does have a buzzer that you have to buzz um, a stranger in. The name has to be first said before the school will even be opened. So that helps reassure them as well. Is it okay to say, I don't know, to some of their questions? I love that question. Parents always think they need to know the answers. Right. So if, oh, always. And if you don't know, absolutely, it is not only okay, it is healthy and it is helpful if you are truthful and say, I don't know. But you can't just leave it at that. The next step then is you need to say, I don't know. That is a very good question. I am going to find out the answer. So by letting them know their question is significant and then telling them that you will research the answer and then the next step is to get back to them with the answer, that will be very reassuring for them. So it's almost just like you said about reassuring about the buzzers or the security measures already at school. Same thing, saying, hey, look, you're not the only one who doesn't know their questions. Mom or dad doesn't either, and we're going to find out. Right. You're, you're picking up on my theme here, Kevin, which is the theme of reassurance. It's all about the child experiencing the parent as being okay, role modeling an attitude of reassurance and calm helps them to feel reassured and calm. If rather you are uptight and nervous and anxious about this, that will absolutely impact your child's reactive response as well.
Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, but as a parent of little kids, my approach has been to shield them from this story completely. No images on TV and, and when they're around and no talk about it at all. It's really great to shield your young children if you can, because we want to protect them from not having to hear about this trauma. But the fact is that there are even young children who you can't shield from this because they are in programs at preschools. And there is always some child that's going to spill the beans. So the fact is, if your child has found out already, or if you're concerned that your child will find out, it's much better as a parent to communicate with your young child, not in a way where they're hearing and seeing the television on all the time and what's going on, because that is not therapeutic. They can then experience a trauma response. Rather, you speak on their level. If they're young, you can even say something like, you know, you know how bad things happen in this world, and really good things do too, right? And they're like, oh, yeah, bad things and good things. And you say, yeah, you know, what's an example of a really great thing? And they share with you, and you say, yeah, and then you say, sometimes there's these scary, creepy things that happen, but you know what? We are safe, and if anybody ever says something creepy or bad, who do you think you can go to to ask questions to? And they'll say, uh, you, and then you say, exactly, me. So by planting a seed like that, you now know, okay, if they hear something from somebody else, you've planted the seed that there's scary stuff, which they know anyway, they now know, ooh, I can come to mommy or I can come to daddy or I can come to grandma or grandpa. That is one way of handling the very young age child who you don't think somebody will say something to, but they might. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, this time of year people know, you know, kids spill the beans to use your phrase about Santa Claus. So there's things yeah. that are said out there. Or, <laughs> you know, even the other day I'm in the car with the four-year-old and, and the radio's on and it was a, it was not a news station, which I, I listen to talk radio a lot, but because of the shooting I didn't. And here right. it was, a you know, where they just were giving uh, their condolences. Or even if you're watching a football game, they're having these moments of silence, so the questions could certainly come up. Um, what about parents who will have anxiety now dropping kids off? We've, uh, you know, seen parents uh, who have said, you know, I felt obviously that Monday they had a weekend to think about it, but a lot of them went back to school on that Monday. Uh, you know, we're talking about how the kids are handling it, but what about parents who are going to be, you know, feeling anxiety now when they're doing their errands or whatnot while their child's at school? I'm so glad that you asked that because I will tell you that I have had some of the clients that I work with in my practice have spent some time in their session instead of talking about their usual problems that they're coming in for, rather talking about that they're really having a hard time handling this. Um, they're feeling anxious or they're feeling sad. And it's really important, I explain to them, that you have to allow yourself the luxury of hurting. It, it, nobody wants to hurt. So what's happening is, is adults are just shoving their feelings in a box and not being anxious. I have to not be anxious. I have to not be sad. Move on. Move on. The fact is, take a moment to allow yourself to feel what you're feeling. Be honest with yourself and reflect why you're feeling what you're feeling. And then decide to also balance that with moving forward, with being able to do all of your normal everyday life activities, and that life doesn't stop before that. So it, it, life doesn't stop. You have to continue to move forward. So in essence, you're balancing between the reality of what you're feeling and also being mindful of the fact that this, this is something that you're going to have to move forward on. Still enjoy your life. And enjoying your life doesn't mean you're being disloyal or disrespectful to those lives that are lost. And the anxiety that you're feeling, that's normal and a healthy response but it doesn't mean that that should stop you from doing what you're doing and know, again, that there is a low likelihood that this will happen. So you're doing a lot of the same self-talk to yourself as an adult that what it is that you have shared and stated to your own child. It's very similar in style and technique. And do you try to be as normal as possible with kids after something like this? In other words, you know, someone said to me the other day, wow, people are going to spoil their children on Christmas this year, be Aww. you know, because they're so thankful to have their children with them and alive after the events in Newtown. So is it important to, yes, hug them a little tighter, but also still parent with discipline and the whole nine yards, even though this awful situation is weighing on all of us? Yeah, you know, look, as parents, we, we're so blessed and, and, and feel so thankful those of us who have our children, and certainly we might be doing some extra smooches and hugs and kisses, <laughs> um, but really it's important to be able to 
live life as usual um, because if you go overboard in either direction, either in anxiety or overboard in giving, then the child's picking up on that and thinking, wow, why is he or she reacting this way? Hmm, is there something I should be concerned about? So that could trigger a worried response. So certainly, yes, love it up with your children. Spoil them rotten as much as you want over the holidays as you normally would, but not to do something that's crazy outlandish that just doesn't fit your character as a parent because that will be red flags for your child, and that's what you're trying not to do. I bet you've seen that in uh, separation or divorce cases, right, with the parent who maybe only has the weekend deal, uh, you know, trying to be the fun, the fun guy or the fun girl. Oh, dear, that is so common with with divorces. The yeah. parent who wants to be the fun parent, and the other one is stuck with being the responsible parent. <laughs> Good cop, bad cop, right? Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. We've seen people going after guns on the heels of this shooting, uh, also video games, movies. Uh, are they barking up the wrong tree there? Isn't this maniac who did this to blame, and, and wouldn't the time spent on, say, gun task forces be better served by looking at mental illness or ways to spot red flags along with security measures, or, or do you combine everything? Look, everything affects everything, of course. So you can't not be mindful of the fact that our culture, the things that we have in our culture, affects who we are. But to be attacking and blaming the things in our culture is the reason why we are the way we are. I find that just ridiculous, quite frankly. You know, as, as a mental health expert, as a therapist, every day I try and help my clients to take ownership of their own behavior regardless of what's around us. If we say, oh, well, I had to shoot because I have a gun, or I had to trip that person because they punched me, or I had to do drugs because it's there... It, it's all about taking ownership. So if we're pointing our fingers at guns, we're pointing our fingers at games, as parents, parents, it goes back to parenting, a lot of this does, which is if you have a child that you're noticing signs and symptoms, because we notice them at a young age, it's imperative that we implement early intervention. Early intervention of children greatly and dramatically increases the chances that there will not be violence in the older years. So your question of should we be looking at mental illness rather than blaming our culture, the answer is yes. We should be looking at mental illness. We should be improving upon benefit packages. Our focus should be on how do we help children when they are struggling when they are young, especially during the tween and teen years, because those years you see behaviors that escalate in the 20s, and young boys and men in particular, because if you look at these massacres through the years, the consistent pattern is these young men. Oh, yeah, every time. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. You got it. So there's got to be something to that. Doctor, what do you suggest as far as moving forward if someone spots a kid, or an adult for that matter, that they feel is very strange or showing signs of behavior that's troubling? Who do you talk to? I mean, we don't know all the details, but should this shooter in Newtown, should he have been reported for something he did at some point before this went down? Right. Well, there's so many signs along the way. So think of it like this, right? A kid touches the lives of many. There's teachers in school, there's pediatricians, there's possibly mental health professionals along the way, there's certainly the parents and or grandparents, there's other children and other children's parents at, you know, play dates and so forth. These are the people's lives that children touch, that notice that their eyes eyebrows and eyeballs raise when they think, hmm, something's off about this kid. If you think truly think something's not right to where somebody rubs you the wrong way, your gut is telling you something as an adult, whether you're an expert, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a fellow parent. And my belief is that if you go and share this information with the parent of the child and say, I'm really concerned and this is an uncomfortable position for me to be in because it's not my child, but I'm sharing this with you because we as a culture are supposed to look out for each other. The hope would be, and this is not always the case though, very often not the case, Kevin, that the parent would then say, 
you know, I, I've noticed some of these same things too. I, I really should go and I, I should talk to, you know, a mental health expert about this. I should talk to the pediatrician about this. Often instead the parent sweeps it under the rug because they think, no, not my child, or they just don't want to look at it or they're too busy. The key is if somebody ever says something to you about your child, take it seriously, check it out, have your eyes open, and take action. Sarah Palin said the political and media machine play starring roles in our failing society. She says too often they tear down those who try to do good while elevating and celebrating corrupt selfishness. Agreed? Well, of course, agreed. But, you know, just because that's happening, though, doesn't mean that it's an excuse for why we are the way we are. I believe it's played a role. I believe that it's exacerbated an already existing condition within the human mind, which is immediate impulsivity. I must have what I want when I want it. And if I'm not feeling well emotionally, well, then who's going to pay the price for that? All of our environment is not conducive to mental health and wellness. So absolutely agreed, but not an excuse. And this is where it all comes from the family. And if you are a young adult now and your family hasn't done some good parenting and you think to yourself, gosh, I'm not feeling well. Like take the 18 or the 19-year-old young man or young woman, these cases as we just talked about, young men, and they're not feeling well. Can they take ownership of this? If they're feeling depressed, if they're feeling angry, should they? They should. It would be great if they could. But often is mental health care something that's a little bit of a stigma attached and maybe you don't want to go for counseling? It is. But you know what? I'm, I'm hoping to change that. And my mission when I go on television, when I'm on the radio, when I'm contributing to print media, it is to truly be an upstander and not a bystander. And if I hear something that I disagree with, I want to speak up and say what needs to happen. So, you know, I mean, I really appreciate you having me on to share this stuff today, but that's what needs to happen. People need to speak up. Yeah, I think I think the governor addressed that, too. When you say speak up, uh, another comment on Newtown uh, from Governor Palin, she said, now is the time to speak truth, however politically incorrect some may yeah. deem it. And that struck me, because I think it's just what you said, especially when kids are in harm's way. I, I found that very important, and it's very simple. Speak up. It, you know, it's kind of like police tell you when they say, you know, you see a weird car on the street, call us. That's our job. Don't wait till you know, the guy gets out of the car to do whatever the heck he shouldn't be doing. So. Oh, my goodness. Just, you know, you have to speak up when... when when I was on um, when I was on Hannity the other night, and there was another um, expert that was on, and he had shared a point about Aspergers, and I, you know, just in that quick moment, you know, I'm thinking to myself, gosh, it it's not really, I guess, my turn to speak, so maybe I should be quiet and just wait my turn. Sure. But in that split moment, I thought to myself, I, I cannot do that. I'm, I'm not on there just to be a face. I'm on there right. because of my wisdom, because of what I have to say. So I had to jump in and share what it was that I was thinking and feeling. And that's what we all need to be doing. If there's something that we are concerned about, we must. We must all stand up for our beliefs. And if, we, and if our children see us doing that, then they will learn that as well. And we can change this culture around to be a culture rather of standing up and making the right decision, even when nobody's looking. You know, we've all heard of that one. Sure. And that, that's great advice, the speaking up. And uh, Governor Palin also said, build resolve and seek truth more aggressively than ever at such a time like this. And she also said, don't rely on Hollywood or Washington. And there's definitely too much of that going on today. Oh, my gosh. I, you know, when we talk about reliance, I'm in complete agreement with the concept of taking ownership. And often um, what's interesting is people raise their eyebrow a bit and they say, wait a minute, isn't that in contradiction to being a therapist? Isn't you know being a therapist all about you're helping them? What do you mean people should be self-reliant and take ownership? And I say, no, no, actually I'm a solution-focused therapist. And what that means is when people come to me with me, I help them to understand the concept that I'm here to help them to help themselves get to a better place by offering concrete solutions, helping them to learn how to find their own solutions and take ownership. So if they're not feeling well, you must take ownership of that. You can't rely on, well, somebody else is going to save me or give me or help me you must save yourself and if you're not feeling well you must seek out help well dr karen ruskin you are great so knowledgeable and you get things across so people can understand it we, we hope to talk to you again and and perhaps on a much happier topic 
Thank you, Kevin. You can feel free to call me anytime. I'm I, an honor, really, to be on your program. Thank you so much. For more, go to drkarenruskin.com. You can even ask her a question on the site, drkarenruskin.com. Talking with Dr. Ruskin, we talked about some of Governor Palin's comments on the Newtown tragedy. The piece titled The Only Hope is really worth a full read. We highlighted some of the governor's thoughts with Dr. Ruskin, but please check out the entire piece. It's on Sarah Palin's Facebook page, The Only Hope. It's winning accolades from many, calling it the best take on the Connecticut shootings. Governor Palin also highlighted a powerful video about Jesus with CeeLo Green's rendition of Mary Did You Know under it. It is a must-see. You can also view the video through the governor's Facebook page. With Jim DeMint getting set to take over the Heritage Foundation, South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley has named Representative Tim Scott the new appointee to replace DeMint in the U.S. Senate. Music to Tea Partiers' ears. Sarah Palin tweeted, Congratulations to Tim Scott and the great state of South Carolina, and thank you, Governor Haley. Well, all of us at Saranet Radio wish Tim Scott well. A super piece from Jeff Poor at the Daily Caller titled Swing and a Miss. New York Magazine's Gabe Sherman gets Fox News hit piece wrong. In it, Poor shows Gabe Sherman's article on New York Magazine's website that cited sources detailing an edict from Fox News weekend executive producer David Clark with instructions not to discuss the gun control issue after Newtown was nothing more than a case of Sherman allowing his personal grudge to creep into his work. Poor called it sloppy and full of factual errors and misrepresentations. Turns out the message from Clark was not the network-wide edict it had been portrayed as, rather an email to three people concerning a panel discussion on one show. Check out the whole piece at dailycaller.com. Sarah Palin implores Barack Obama to help the American pastor jailed in Iran for his Christian faith. The U.S. citizen and Christian convert from Islam is held in Iran and has been beaten repeatedly. Governor Palin is also encouraging retweets of her support for Pastor Saeed on Twitter. Now, our weekly commentary, Steel Resolve. In this week for Sarah Steelman, here's Dan Bongino. Thanks, Kevin. Economist Thomas Sowell once wrote that men are never more sincere as when they are asserting their own moral superiority. This has historically been the approach of the far left wing of the Democratic Party in an effort to demean and diminish conservative ideas and to avoid having a genuine conversation on the issues, seemingly assisting them in furthering their claim to the, quote, moral high ground. Some establishment Republicans have hesitated to counter their baseless attacks and have even resorted to apologizing and adopting their language in the process. The purpose of my commentary today is to implore those Republicans and anyone else enmeshed in the political process to not only see no ground, but to begin to move forward. Representative Nancy Pelosi recently took her turn in front of the microphones on Capitol Hill to tell a compliant press corps how heartless Republicans, and I quote, were taking away children's nutrition programs and meals on wheels with their budget cut proposals. The utter absurdity of this statement is readily transparent to any American citizen aware of our near catastrophic levels of government spending. Yet, our counterattacks have been to accommodate the administration by legislatively agreeing to the quote, to hike taxes on millionaires, conveniently making $250,000. Hike taxes on millionaires, making $250,000? Really? That's the problem? We've spent away a generation of prosperity and human dignity, in the process callously forcing a lower standard of living on our children, mine included, in an effort to avoid short-term pain. And the best we can do as Republicans is to agree to a tax rate hike, which does absolutely nothing to solve our spending problem and will likely hasten the demise of our already struggling economy. I'll leave you today with this request. Be the unsilent minority. Call, write, email, volunteer. Contact your local representative, representatives and ask them all what they stand for. Demand answers and demand action, except no less. Do not spend another moment as a compliant witness to an ongoing political crime being committed against our children, yours and mine. You deserve better. They deserve better. 
And while our political opponents sit back and celebrate the demise of conservatism and revel in their electoral successes, we'll begin to retrench, reorganize, and prepare for this next coming political fight. Remember, words are cheap. Action matters. And if you do nothing, you become part of the problem. There is no time to waste. Always remember, political battles are temporary, but philosophical battles are perpetual. There is no finish line. For Saranet Radio, I'm Dan Bongino. Tune in again next week for another segment of Steel Resolve right here on the Palin Update. And don't forget the Palin Update, including Steel Resolve, is now on demand and available for download. So just head to saranetradio.net, pick the show you want to hear, and you can listen anywhere, anytime. Well, that'll just about do it for this edition of the Palin Update on Saranet Radio. Visit saranetradio.net for continuing coverage of Governor Palin. I want to thank Dan Bongino and everyone here at Saranet Radio. Thanks to Dr. Karen Ruskin, and thank you for listening today. Please be sure to join us next time for another edition of the Palin Update. I'm Kevin Shola. Have a pleasant day, and Merry Christmas!